Hi, good morning. Um, welcome to this uh, panel. We're now going to hear um, Jessica Stutzman, a doctoral st a student from the American Military University. And now I pass the, the floor to you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, you can see I'm on camera right now. I will be turning my feed off here in just a moment to preserve uh, some bandwidth just so we make sure that we have the connectivity that will also keep my cat off of the screen and keep this a very focused presentation. Um, so I'll wave to you folks that are here. I'm going to turn the video off. Um, so again, thank you for joining me today to talk about the intersection of how open source intelligence and criminology come together. Uh, we will be discussing uh, impacts of open source intelligence misuse in criminology, uh, the legal repercussions and erosion of public trust in law enforcement agencies. There we go. Our objecti objectives today are going to be to review practices of OSINT use by law enforcement, identify legal permissions and repercussions uh, when misuse occurs. We'll look at a single case study of OSINT misuse since we are a little bit short on time today. And we're going to talk about some best practice recommendations, both from the literature and just both from kind of an experiential perspective. As we go through the content today, we'll be providing first uh, a foundational overview of OSINT and publicly available information. We'll highlight their very important roles in the intelligence gathering process. We'll also explain how that actually applies to law enforcement since they're not traditionally viewed as being part of the intelligence community. Uh, following this, we'll explore applications and impacts of uh, open source use in law enforcement, and we'll focus on the balance between it being used and kind of individual right protection. We'll then define, uh, propose a definition of OSINT misuse, uh, setting the stage to discuss accountability and responsibility. Uh, the need for public trust in law enforcement will be an important discussion point here, um, emphasizing the importance of responsible use of open source information and maintaining that trust level. From there, we will discuss uh, the consequences and uh, consequences of misapplication and present a case study illustrating world road scenarios. Um, we will specifically discuss the uh, Minneapolis Police Department investigation that's being uh, that has been undertaken over the last couple years. Uh, we'll look at findings from both the Minneapolis uh, investigation and the larger Department of Justice investigation and their results. We'll briefly discuss the literature view of all of this content. I don't want to bore anybody or put you to sleep, so we'll try to keep that one short, but we will just highlight kind of the big themes and some of the gaps that exist there. Uh, from that point, we'll start discussing some of the risk mitigation strategies for using open source intelligence in the law enforcement uh, world. Um, and then we'll go through some of the gaps in that risk mitigation strategy and how we can address them moving forward. We'll also talk about some recommendations for those that are working in the OSINT field or have interaction with OSINT um, you know, information or technology. And we'll also throw some recommendations out for those of you that are in academia and want to help contribute to um, the research in this area. So first we'll dive into what is the core of open source uh, intelligence and it's publicly available information, which is often abbreviated as PAI. Uh, we've got citations uh, throughout the presentation. There will be a reference slide at the end. If you'd like copies of the slides, feel free to let me know and reach out. I'll have my contact information up for you as well in case you do want those. Um, so you'll just see references here. We won't go through many of them by name today. Um, publicly available information through a variety of sources, they agree on some very broad topics. It is information that's published and broadcast for public consumption. It's accessible online or otherwise to the public, although in today's day and age, the majority of when people reference open source and PAI, they are talking about internet-based online information. It is available to the public by subscription or purchase. Uh, the purchase in that p uh, point is subject to debate. That is not the point of today's conversation. There are all alternate definitions for things called commercially available information, which would be purchased information. Today, we'll discuss anything that relates to PAI. We'll include those tools and that purchase data as part of our um, overview and how we're referencing things. PAI is also anything that could be seen or heard by a casual observer. So that leads into our definition of open source intelligence, uh, which is intelligence produced from publicly available information and then collected, exploited, and disseminated in a timely manner to an appropriate audience for a specific intelligence requirement. Uh, that definition comes to us from both the DOD and from public law 109-163, um, explaining that information. Uh, the definition of open source intelligence, just like PAI, is subject to a variety of debate 
Uh, every intelligence agency seems to define it differently. Uh, the US government has not yet agreed on a firm definition of that. However, this generalized uh, definition is what we'll use today as we talk about this content. It's not clandestine information. It is out in the open and available to anybody um, so the distinction lies in how that information is used to fulfill that intelligence needs, uh, which helps contribute to our larger goal of having informed and effective law enforcement. And if you're at this point and you're thinking, well, law enforcement agencies are not part of the intelligence community, how are they doing OSINT? Uh, again, it's a very semantic part of the conversation. And it is true that law enforcement agencies primarily focus on enforcing the law, but they do also engage in some intelligence work to prevent, detect, and investigate various criminal activities, especially in the context of addressing organized crime, counterterrorism, and cybercrime. So that is the context that we're using when we're discussing open source use uh, in law enforcement today. Um, we'll highlight some of the uses and how they've uh, kind of been explored by law enforcement and how they've been addressed in the literature. Uh, cybersecurity and cybercrime investigations are used uh, pretty frequently by law enforcement. Uh, the landscape there is uh, vast and ever-changing, but using um, open source in those investigations help unmask digital footprints of malicious actors, dissect some of their methodology, and build defenses that are going to help enforce um, our infrastructure and help si safeguard our cyber uh, realm. Human trafficking and exploitation, uh, OSINT has been a vital, vital tool there. There are a number of nonprofit organizations that primarily use open source data to uh, combat human trafficking and exploitation concerns. Uh, they use vigilant monitoring of online platforms, and they've been able to use that to uncover cases, gather evidence, locate victims, and even bring some of those criminals to justice. Um, it helps shine a light on a lot of the content that goes on in the dark web, which is where a lot of these human trafficking operations can occur on the internet. It's also been used for event monitoring by law enforcement. In times of large public demonstrations and live events, it's been very key for event monitoring, whether that's looking at social media feeds or looking at YouTube videos of live events as they occur. It helps allocate resources a little bit more strategically if you're looking at large crowds. It can help ensure effective police presence in appropriate locations, um, help maintain order, and help protect community well-being. It's also been used for gangs and human networking. Uh, tracking and analysis. Uh, New York is home to the largest police department in the United States, and they've used this extensively for tracking and identifying gang dynamics. Uh, using social network analysis, they've also been able to help identify individuals that are um, prone to either incurring violence or being a victim of violence, just enabled them to target responses to more specifically protect and engage with their communities. Uh, counterterrorism, it's been a huge, huge factor in law enforcement uh, counterterrorism efforts. Again, I'll point to the NYPD, who has a variety of engagement with counterterrorism activities. Uh, it's been critical for them, helps them kind of be eyes and ears uh, on the ground and on the internet, helping to identify and monitor um, potential terrorist activities, radicalization ex uh, efforts, and their examination of public data sources in this regard helps with intercepting potential threats, which again contributes to the larger landscape of public safety. So now that we've kind of reviewed some of the ways that this gets used in law enforcement, we'll talk about uh, the legal uh, kind of constraints and what the legal landscape looks like for use of PAI and open source information. Uh, there are a number of legal precedents and recommend uh, regulations that permit the use of OSINT by law enforcement agencies. Uh, they're grounded primarily in the principle that information that's open to the public can be accessed and used by anybody, including by law enforcement. However, this information does have to comply with constitutional and statutory protections uh, related to privacy and due process. So uh, we've got a list of examples here on the screen. We won't get into the, the very large details with all of them because, again, we do have limited time today. Uh, but the Fourth Amendment... Um, protects individuals from unreasonable searches and seizures. I'm sure we're all familiar with that. Uh, that is a contested area of OSINT use. There are some current precedents that are being introduced uh, to try to limit um, OSINT use as it relates to the Fourth Amendment. So you could look into the Fourth Amendment is not for sale act and see how that may uh, limit the usage of that information in the future. However, right now, there is uh, essentially permission for that to be um, a basis for permissible use of open source intelligence. Third party doctrine uh, establishing cases like Smith versus Maryland uh, holds that information that's been voluntarily shared with a third party, like a phone company or a bank, 
carries a reduced expectation of privacy and can be used and accessed by law enforcement via restrictions. Uh, that's been used, I believe, in the New York area, um, specifically when a friend of a uh, subject of investigation willingly disclosed information that the subject posted on their social media account that was considered valid under third party doctrine. Part of the uh, Electronic Communications Privacy Act, the Stored Communications Act governs access to stored electronic communications data, um, sorry, communications data. It lets law enforcement access certain communications data uh, stored by third party service providers. Um, sometimes it does require a warrant or subpoena. Uh, there are some loopholes that have been identified through other parts of the ECPA. Um, that have been interpreted to allow enforcement, uh, law enforcement agencies to acquire that data uh, without legal process like warrants or subpoenas. This highlights a need in the open source space uh, to update advance, uh, update requirements with the advances that we've had in technology. Uh, the Fourth Amendment was written back in the 1700s. They could not possibly have imagined what the digital landscape looks today. So a lot of these laws, when they did come into existence, uh, do not govern the landscape appropriately um, or with enough detail there's also a variety of case laws uh, that apply um, here. So Carpenter is one of the largest ones. It established that a warrant would be required for government access to cell site location data. So also commonly referred to as advertising ID data uh, if it was needed for seven days or more. That's raised questions about Fourth Amendment protections again. And then CATS has also, uh, CATS versus the United States has also been used uh, to explain away some permissions for using law enforcement uh, information uh, law enforcement, sorry, for law enforcement use of open source information. Uh, largely says that information that's exposed to the public is not subject to Fourth Amendment protections. Um, again, that was a very, very, uh, well, at this point, I say very old, but I believe that was in the 60s or early 70s. Uh, so again, was not determined at a time when the internet and digital landscape was at this level uh, of discussion and of detail. There's also a variety of state legislations that govern access and use of PAI information a little bit more strictly. Things like the California Consumer Privacy Act has far stricter data protections than current U.S. federal regulations. Uh, New Hampshire and Hawaii also have state constitutions that are a lot more strict with that kind of information. So now we've talked about the ways that all of this is legally allowed to be used. We'll talk about what we mean when we say OSINT misuse. That was part of our uh, title of this presentation, Impacts of Open Source Intelligence Misuse. Uh, so what exactly do we mean when we say misuse? It seems pretty clear that we would talk about things that are you know, violating the boundaries of the law. But since the law is uh, subject to a wide variety of interpretation, it's a little bit tougher to define what we mean by OSINT misuse. There is no specific U.S. government codification or standardized definition for what it means to misuse or use open source information inappropriately. Laws and guidelines around misuse of this type of information usually fall under much broader categories like abuse of power, invasion of privacy, unauthorized surveillance, or violation of civil liberties. So when these are being charged and prosecuted in the larger landscape, they are often um, using precedents around those uh, individual kind of statutes and you know larger subjects. So today I'm going to offer the definition uh, that OSINT misuse by law enforcement officers or government agencies, or in general, OSINT misuse, refers to the inappropriate, unethical, or unlawful use of open source intelligence information, and by extension, collected from PAI information, such as social media, online forums, websites. So this misuse can manifest itself in a variety of ways, and we've got some of them listed on the screen here. Uh, conducting surveillance or conducting data on groups without authorization, using tools and resources for personal information, uh, personal use. So great examples of that, something that we see very often uh, thrown out in the DOD is do not use open source information to stalk your ex-girlfriend or your ex-boyfriend. That is explicitly inappropriate use of that material. Uh, discriminatory targeting, and we'll see some examples of that when we get into the case study, using OSINT specifically to target uh, very ident like easy uh, demographics, communities, or groups based on race, ethnicity, religion, rather than credible threats or public safety concerns. This is something that happens, and again, we'll revisit that in the case study. We also have issues like bypassing legal protocols, using that data without legal permissions. Uh, if you need a subpoena to get it, but you find a way around that subpoena, that would be an inappropriate or an unethical use of this information. 
There's also been some misuse in things like recruitment, where people have uh, reviewed social media information that is supposed to be private and used it to ban folks from uh, getting jobs or being extended job offers. Um, disinformation and deceptive practices, engaging in online activities that are deceptive or inappropriate, like using sock puppets or uh, fake social media profiles to manipulate or deceive uh, individuals or organizations. We'll see some examples of that in the case study as well. Now, there's also um, inappropriate use would be allow allowing your folks to use this information with no accountability and no oversight. We will also see examples of that in our case study today. So now that we've defined what we mean by open source uh, misuse, we will talk about why uh, public trust is necessary for the landscape uh, in the first place. Uh, there's a huge need for public uh, trust in law enforcement. It's relied on very heavily to get cooperation from community members reporting crimes and providing information uh, that helps solve cases and ensure public safety. And we've got a variety of things listed here uh, that kind of a, a identify and exemplify this a bit more. Uh, trust in law enforcement enhances legitimacy and authority of police officers. That's very, very important for good active policing. Um, same thing with proactive policing there. Officer safety and morale. Uh, officers are safer in the community when they are trusted agents. Um, they are more easily able to de-escalate volatile situations, and it helps boost their morale, which is going to be good for their well-being and job performance. Uh, resource allocation and funding. Public trust and having high trust and confidence in law enforcement allows them to continue getting funding they need to continue operating appropriately. As we saw with the uh, Minnesota, or as we will see with the Minnesota Police Department, uh, a lot of the issues that occurred that led to that investigation resulted in giant movements for defund the police. Um, that was largely not part of the conversation before we started to see uh, abuse of the public trust through agencies and organizations like that. Uh, public compliance and order, crisis and emergency response, these are fairly self-explanatory and I'm going to kind of breeze over those just for the sake of time here today. But I will be happy to address any of this in a later conversation uh, when we do have a little bit more time to speak freely. So impacts of using open source information inappropriately, misusing it uh, on the public trust. Um, we've seen in a lot of the literature and a lot of the case studies, a lot of the other information that's out there that it leads directly to an erosion of people's feelings of privacy. Uh, they feel like they're being surveilled, um, leading to discomfort and just a sense of invasion of privacy. It may also lead to a chilling effect where people are afraid to express themselves freely online for uh, fears of being misinterpreted or fears of being, you know, having reprisal against them. That can also lead to uh, racial uh, disproportionate targeting in the ways of racial profiling or political bias. Um, misusing OSINT to criticize elected officials or groups can create a perception that law enforcement may be biased politically. There's obviously legal and ethical concerns here. Anytime there are legal and ethical concerns around policing, uh, like things like bypassing legal procedures, um, so abusing OSINT to bypass traditional legal processes or engaging in unethical behavior like creating fake profiles, that damages the public perception, perception of law enforcement integrity. Uh, transparency and accountability, um, fairly straightforward. There are also long-term repercussions like damage to the credibility of law enforcement organizations uh, and having negative community relations. Uh, there's potential for abuse through personal vendettas and unfair vetting. And there's a lot of unintended consequences that may occur, uh, like decreased reporting of crimes because somebody doesn't want to be targeted or doesn't want to be researched. And erosion of agency reputation kind of underscores all of this. Um, all of these items lead to reputations of agencies and individuals being eroded, and that just makes it much, much harder for uh, police to effectively do their job. Um, legal and ethical repercussions of this type of misuse. So obviously disciplinary action uh, sort of, although it should go without saying, we will say it anyway. Um, these happen at both the individual and the agency level. Over the last couple of years, we've seen a number of instances where police have been prosecuted uh, for inappropriate acts and conduct. This happens for social media misuse as well. It's just not as highly publicized. Uh, there are also legal actions. So other than disciplinary action, maybe being fired, put on suspension, uh, they're prosecuted in courts and placed in jail, along with a variety of other uh, legal fact uh, factors that occur against both the individual and agency, like we will see in the case study. Also, a loss of employees is something that occurs uh, if your 
uh, folks are violating these laws, violating these rules, they are subject to being fired. Uh, if folks are being fired in mass, this leads to a much uh, more difficult process of recruitment and retention. And then public skepticism, again, which just helps lead to um, more challenges for police out in the field. And then more difficulty in identifying and going um, Sorry, I totally lost my train of thought. Uh, hindering their crime solving efforts. So we're gonna get into our case study here. We're gonna talk about um, the Minneapolis Police Department investigation. Uh, so this investigation arose as a result of the George Floyd uh, incident in Minneapolis uh, or in that surrounding area. Uh, there were a variety of problems here. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Human Rights conducted a huge investigation as did the Department of Justice. Uh, the results that they came back with were very alarming. Um, there was clear targeting of Black leaders, organizations, and officials with no basis. Uh, there was no criminal aspect for to provide a reasoning for this investigation. Um, and there was no, uh, no justification able to be provided during this larger investigation. Uh, this negatively impacted the trust in the community uh, by targeting leaders and organizations without clear safety objectives. Um, that rose to concerns of racial profiling and biased policing, which was an underlying uh, theme throughout the entire investigation. Uh, secondary portion to this was uh, open source misuse in the relate in uh, by way of unrelated surveillance. Um, so they were deployed covert social media accounts for conducting surveillance on black individuals, leaders, and these organizations. Again, there was no criminal activity being undertaken. There was no larger mission there to identify criminal activity uh, or you know, use this information for public safety. Uh, the use of those private accounts brought up a lot of privacy concerns, uh, fear from a variety of folks in the, in the community of being discriminated against, and it led to the deterioration or the further deterioration of the community police relationship. Those individuals also used those fake accounts, commonly referred to as sock puppets in the community, uh, to criticize elected officials. Um, that was a very interesting uh, development of this case. Um, which led to, you know, individuals feeling like there was an undermining of the democratic process where individuals were using their uh, positions of power to criticize officials uh, through fake accounts um, and try to, you know, dissuade or convince other folks to feel the same way. Um, it allowed or it led to questioning of the integrity of the department and loss of credibility of the department. It also led many people to question whether the information that they saw at any time about those officials was true or false. The larger uh, landscape of governance in the Minneapolis Police Department related to open source PAI use uh, was that they were operating with a lack of oversight and accountability. It led to a huge potential for abuse, which we saw occurred in a variety of instances. Um, the absence of effective oversight and review of their covert social media account enabled them to do all of these unlawful activities, um, inappropriate activities, and activities of misuse. This led to huge demands for reform, which we're still seeing with the defund the police movements um, and general erosion of public confidence. So there were a variety of legal repercussions that came from this investigation. Uh, there were probable cause findings of race discrimination through both the MPD and uh, Department of Justice investigation a variety of officer discipline. Uh, from 2020 and 2021, there are 78 uh, disciplinary actions for Minneapolis police officers. The Department of Justice reported that in May 2023, there were only 585 sworn officers in the MPD. Uh, that's a 34% decline. There were almost 900 officers in 2018 before all of these activities were uh, undertaken. There's development of consent decrees. Uh, the Human Rights Department will work with Minneapolis PD to have court enforceable agreements outlining changes and timelines for all of their uh, investigative discoveries to get everything in line with what appropriate oversight looks like. There were also a number of immediate changes and reforms, uh, a lot of discussion with stakeholders in the community, um, and there are still pending repercussions, uh, legal repercussions and disciplinary actions against a variety of officers that were involved in these activities. So this is a huge reminder um, and great case highlighting the potential repercussions of this misuse. Now, granted, these were undertaken uh, in conjunction with a variety of other issues, um, but this is still a very, very good case to use uh, to explain these problems. So again, we're not going to get into the literature review too thoroughly, um, since we don't want to put anybody to sleep and we are a little bit short on time. Um, but the literature review uh, of this content 
largely resulted in finding that there was a lot of uh, guidance on using open source data for employment vetting, how to conduct investigations and how to use it for your benefit as an agency. And then there were some policy recommendations on personal use, uh, what officers should and shouldn't do, uh, what agencies should and shouldn't do when they're using public facing accounts and actually broadcasting themselves. And again, policy recommendations for using it for investigations. These are all great things to address in literature, but there are some gaps, um, especially in the empirical data on actual OSINT misuse by law enforcement. There is almost no literature or research into the instances of misuse, case studies of these misuses. Um, and that makes it really, really difficult to understand the larger implications on policy and strategy development for open source uh, misuse. It would be great to address this gap um, and it'd be very, very practical since we could help create evidence-based policies for use and you know, identification of misuse, um, helping to contribute building and maintaining public trust uh, to avoid those issues in the first place. Um, so we'll go briefly through our risk mitigation strategies. Uh, things that exist in the literature today are things like using that information ethically, having data validation procedures in place. So actually, if you see something once, validate it somewhere else before you use it uh, in an investigation. Security measures, like having secure handling and storage of collected data so you're not accidentally leaking PII. Uh, legal compliance, again, complying with all of these laws. And uh, I don't have a reference for transparency when misuse occurs, but that is my personal recommendation. Um, it is much less incriminating on an agency to say, hey, we screwed this up. We want to tell you about it. And rather than have an incident, have it covered up, and then have it come out later on the front page of the New York Times. That's a very bad look for everybody. So transparency my personal opinion, not academically related, is that the transparency is going to be a huge factor in mitigating some of these risks and uh, maintaining trust as we move forward. Um, there's some areas for improvement in the current existing um, you know, literature and guidelines, and that's uniformity. There is no uniformity between um, what's recommended by the larger uh, intelligence organizations to lower level police departments. Um, there's also not a lot of public awareness of what open source is, is not, and does and doesn't do. Um, there's a huge need for training and education, uh, especially as technology develops. Um, we need to be able to kind of keep these uh, up to speed with the changes in the environment. Um, recommendations for the larger OSINT industry. Um, if you are in the industry, we'd say help contribute by standardizing your guidelines. Enhance your training of your individuals and your employees and people that are using and handling this data. Engage with your uh, public counterparts if you have them. Provide regular updates to your guidelines, your techniques, and your methodologies. Uh, have robust oversight mechanisms. Having oversight and knowing what your individuals are doing at all times is very, very important and will help minimize these risks. And again, transparency and accountability. We want to promote transparency with OSIT use and establish clear lines of accountability uh, to prevent misuse and help build public trust. I also have some recommendations if you are in academia and you want to continue to contribute to uh, this line of research and this line of work. Um, potentially, we could collaborate with law enforcement agencies, have partnerships to review this data and review these instances as they occur. That would allow us to get some more uh, primary source data from these incidents, and we would have more research to do uh, based on that data being accurate and not being something reported through a third-party news agency. Um, use diverse research methodologies. Uh, use surveys, interviews, case studies. If, be creative. Um, look at interdisciplinary approaches, like combining um, intelligence studies and criminology, like we're doing today. Um, potentially use comparative studies or in-depth case studies. I uh, would love to have been able to go more in-depth into uh, the MPD discussion, but again, we are a little bit limited on time today. Um, public perception and trust studies would be really interesting as well, looking at public trust and the efficacy of law enforcement activities and how those are negatively impacted. I'd be very curious to see MPD uh, change in the next five years and how the relationships there change. Um, also look at legal and ethical considerations governing this landscape. And then again, look at technology evolution and OSINT tools. And uh, probably the most important thing for all of us is accessibility. Have the research archived, have it online, have it where we can all access and review this information so we can contribute to this landscape ourselves. So as we wrap up today, um, 
we've got a list here of kind of the key things we've discussed. Uh, we've explored significant impact on public trust when OSIN is misused. Uh, it's fundamental and foundational for credible law enforcement and governance today. Our work does not stop here at the end of this conversation or at the end of this presentation. Uh, we do need to foster collaboration and mutual respect with the various sectors that are using this data. Um, so uh, I guess that's it for today. I don't want to go uh, any longer than I have to. So thank you all for being here. If there are any questions uh, or later discussions you want to have, um, I've got a series of resources here I'll be happy to send to you. Um, I'm happy to take questions, but I don't want to go over. Um, so please reach out. If you look uh, on the IP, uh, the, the Criminology Conference website, you will see my abstract that has some contact information. If you're watching this as a recording, here's my contact information for you. The PangeaResearch.io email will always be available uh, for you to reach out to me and feel free to connect on LinkedIn. Tell me you were here. If you hated the presentation, let me know. If you loved it, also let me know. Happy to take any feedback and um, kind of continue this conversation. So thank you uh, very, very much. And uh, Anna, if you're in the room still, I would be yeah. uh, happy to turn it back to you. Yeah, thank you for your interesting presentation. We do have a question. Uh, Keith uh, Ludwig asks, well, uh, oh. congratulate you, congratulate you for your presentation. And he says, do you see this issue getting better or getting worse? Are law enforcement agencies becoming more conscious of these issues? Um, so I, it could go one of two ways, uh, Dr. Ludwig, uh, our, our liege, um, as, as you were. Um, and it, it depends on how the community responds in the next couple of years. So as we see uh, misuse happening, is the community responding by pretending it's not there and ignoring it and treating it on a one-off basis, or are they treating this as a larger uh, problem? Um, I would love to see the community uh, overall get better at dealing with this type of information. Uh, the OSINT Foundation, uh, I, I will shameless plug for them. I, I do sit on their resourcing and policy committee, but they are attempting to mitigate a lot of these issues by helping bring the larger intelligence community together, helping to codify things in the public realm of what open source is, what PAI is, and things like that. Um, as they move forward, I would love to see a larger group of people like law enforcement agencies um, adopt those definitions, adopt those policy recommendations. As we see those policy recommendations um, be addressed and folks actually, you know, include governance for open source information in their processes and policies and strategies, I think we will see progress and improvement. Um, if we don't see people moving towards those developments and actually building and developing policies on them, I think we will continue to see challenges. So I'm sure that it will be a mix. I am uh, Everly the optimist. I'm very hopeful that we'll see this go in a better direction. Um, and hopefully, you know, things will just continue to improve. I think talking about it helps as well. So the more we can get folks out to do this type of engagement, um, I think that will help bring the issue to the forefront and then bring some of that issue mitigation to the front of people's minds. Thank you very much. Um, the uh... There might be another question. Oh, Dr. Ludwig says he, uh, I think I tend to agree. <laughs> um, Thank you so much. I'm so glad you guys are here. Well, the conversation can continue on the WOVA uh, platform between your presentation and others. I invite you to, to comment there. And thank you very much for your presentation, Jessica. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Everybody have a great day and have a great rest of the conference.